Good afternoon and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you today, whether you're here physically in the room with us or joining us through YouTube. Today we hear from Timothy Tyson, whose new book, The Blood of Emmett Till, revisits the shocking murder of a 14-year-old African-American boy in segregated Mississippi in 1955. In researching the story after more than 30, 50 years, Tyson combed the records, drew on new evidence, and, and interviewed the woman with whom Till allegedly flirted. The blood of Emmett Till has a, attracted advanced praise and favorable early reviews. Jason Parham in the New York Times calls it an account of absorbing and sometimes horrific detail. It's already been reviewed at three times in the New York Times and we will review it again this weekend. So it is really gathering a lot of attention. In the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Joseph Williams calls Tyson a terrific writer and storyteller and declares what, what sets Tyson's book apart is the wide angle lens he uses to examine the lynching and the ugly parallels between past and present. We're pleased to host Timothy Tyson at the National Archives today and hear his telling of the story of Emmett Till. Before, we bring, before I bring Tim up, I'd like to tell you about two programs coming up later this month. On Thursday, February 16th at 7 p.m., we host an evening with Mount Rushmore presidents. You'll have an opportunity to hear and ask questions of four presidents who, memorialized, who are memorialized on Mount Rushmore, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, and that's all I'm telling you about that program. The next week, we have our annual showcase of Academy Award-nominated documentaries and short subjects. From Wednesday, February 22nd to Sunday, the 26th, we'll show the nominees in four categories, documentary feature, documentary short subject, live action short film, and animated short film. This is always a pro popular program, so check archives.gov for the schedule to reserve a seat. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events. There are sign-up sheets in the lobby where you can receive it by regular mail or email. The murder of Emmett Till horrified the nation. Individuals and organizations wrote letters and telegrams to President Dwight Eisenhower, the Attorney General, and other members of his administration to express, express their opinions and call for action. Many of these communications are in the Eisenhower Presidential Library. Many other letters and reports are in the National Archives among records of the Department of Justice and Federal Bureau of Investigation. Sadly, Emmett Till's fate was not unique. Archives records document lynchings and other acts of violence committed against African Americans from the mid-19th century into the 20th century in investigative reports and federal court proceedings. Because we preserve the records, scholars such as today's guest speaker may weave together the details to bring these stories to a greater audience. Timothy Tyson is Senior Research Scholar at the Center for Documentary Studies at Duke University, where I was the librarian, and Visiting Professor of American Christianity and Southern Culture at the Duke Divinity School. He's also the author of Blood Done Sign My Name, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and the winner of the Southern Book Award for Nonfiction, the Grauermeyer Award in Religion, and others. His book, Radio Free Dixie, Robert F. Williams and the Roots of Black Power, won the James Raleigh Prize for Best Book on Race and the Frederick Jackson Turner Prize for Best First Book in U.S. History from the Organization of American Historians. He serves on the executive board of the North Carolina NAACP and the UNC Center for Civil Rights. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Tim Tyson. Hello. The, uh, my, my, my. There's several, there's several of you. Our national birthplace is not Constitution Hall in Philadelphia, where the Constitution was created, 
to establish justice and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. It is not the big house at Monticello where Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, saying that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Words penned, perchance by the light of a lamp brought to him by a person to whom he owned it, held a deed, the mother of his children, perhaps. The birthplace of these yet to be United States is the abyss, quite literally. Uh, the, the abyss of the Atlantic, where the bones of six or seven million Africans settled into the sand long ago, and so begins our story. That was the foundation of Western capitalism. It was the foundation of the economy of the United States. Um, this enormous death machine, which uh, requires a lot, it requires insurance, it requires big money, that's why we know so much now, is because they, they had to keep records because they had to have insurance. It was a huge uh, economic operation, and fundamentally that. But another thing you need is a justification. Oh, they're not Christian. Well, then if they begin to convert, where does that leave the, the system? And white supremacy is born. The, um, the lynching of a 14-year-old black boy from Chicago who's gone down to visit his great aunt and great uncle and his cousins in Mississippi takes us back to that abyss. But it, uh, it also uh, shines a light up from it. Um, this, this deep darkness was our birthplace, but it is not our home. I feel very sure of that. That's my deepest hope, hope invested with uh, belief. Though many struggles lie ahead. So I've come bearing tales of Emmett Till. Some of them new, others uh, interpreted in a new way that is by a, a historian of and practitioner of uh, social revolution, movement, movements. That's what I study, and when I'm not studying it, that's what I'm trying to foment. Um, the Blood of Emmett Till is my fourth book on that subject the black freedom struggle in the South, although it takes place to a significant degree in Chicago and also around the entire world. It's a global story. This is a story of a human being, not an icon or a symbol, but a real human being, a 14-year-old boy who loved baseball. He was a big, he was a big fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers because you see, they had, they had integrated Major League Baseball, and, and then after Jack, Jackie Robinson, a succession of other African-American players, Roy Campanella, and, and then uh, Don Newcomb, who was Emmett's uh, idol, and who was the first black man to uh, uh, win a game in the World Series, although Emmett missed that just by a little. So Emmett was a race man. He didn't root for the White Sox. He didn't root for the Cubs. He rooted for the Brooklyn Dodgers. You know, like black boys all across the country when the Dodgers began to allow black boys to dream. It's really the story of, a, of another human being, a, a courageous, uh, but also a politically astute mother, brokenhearted, who, 
had the courage to turn her unspeakable private agonies into a public and political cause that was intended and in the end did topple the social system, the murder of her son, an inevitable product of that social system. To, to a much less extent, this book includes uh, evidence gleaned from my interviews with Carolyn Bryant Dunham. Carolyn Bryant, who was the 21-year-old white woman at the store counter in Mississippi, uh, who testified at the trial of her husband and her brother-in-law uh, and told a, a deeply poisonous lie. Although it really doesn't matter. For one thing, they had taken the jury out. The judge would not let her testify because nothing that happens in a store three days earlier can, has any, is pertinent to a murder that happens three days later. It doesn't matter what happened. So the judge said, no, 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 no. He took the jury out. She did get to testify. And, and the, the, uh, the defense figured that the, ju the jury would hear about it anyway, which I'm sure they did. But of course, that, that familiar narrative, you know, the black beast rapist and the, the bruised southern white lily, the uh, white, the, I, you know, the symbol of, of white womanhood, uh, that, that story was already hanging all over this. So the, it wasn't like the jurors would have heard a story that they didn't know. Um, also, in the summation, the, uh, the defense mentioned, they said, now this doesn't have anything to do with any incident that happened at a store where Emmett Till molested Carolyn Bright. You know, they, they made sure that the jury uh, knew the story. Um, and she, uh, she recanted that in our interview, uh, saying that part's not true, meaning the, the part that uh, had to do with anything physical, uh, sexual. The, uh, but of course, to me, it really wasn't the morning news. I, I didn't believe that anyway. So that she lied was not, I did not find shocking. Uh, also, um, it, uh, it just didn't make much difference to me. I had, I had, I, I had uh, the notes of her, she talked to her attorney, a family attorney, when her husband had just been arrested and when uh, Emmett Till's body had just been found, and in private to her attorney, she described, and he took very careful notes and thorough, and she described an incident that involved her being insulted, by which she didn't mean actually insulted in the way that you or I would mean insulted. She meant he had violated her racial sensibilities, um, and that he was, you know, he was obnoxious. He was annoying. It had made her mad. No, nothing physical, nothing menacing, nothing sexual when she told the story in private to her attorney. Two weeks later, we get the black beast rapist and, and white womanhood. In truth, she had a harmless exchange with, with uh, Emmett Till and for, this, uh, her, for her alleged honor, uh, several of her kinsmen uh, went and tortured a boy to death. But her story is not the heart of this book. Uh, she has no connection to this book. And truth be told, uh, she's just one source among hundreds, uh, nothing near the most important. Uh, now, one of my most important characters are the men and women that I call the Mississippi Underground. That is to say, grassroots activists in Mississippi who had been it was unbelievable and frightening, actually, to read uh, about, uh, you know, when Brown versus Board of Education came down, they, people like Medgar Evers and Amzie Moore and Dr. T.R.M. Howard um, and, and many, many others began uh, organizing parents to sign petitions asking for their children to be enrolled at, at what were all white schools. This is in 1955 in Mississippi. I mean, 
this is off the political chart. And the white folks are already just in an absolute furor that transcends rationality. Uh, the notion of black boys and white girls in the same school, if you want to get right down to it, was a molten core of this. But it, uh, it just violated their sense of everything good, right, true, and uh, acceptable. The, the, uh, there is all, they were, the NAACP and the Regional Council of Negro Leadership, this Mississippi Underground, uh, was also pressing for voter registration. There were majority black counties in Mississippi at the time who had no, not one registered black voter. Um, so that's, the, and that had been the grist of the mill. Those, the, the students that came down for Freedom Summer in 1964 from Harvard and Yale and Stanford, uh, they did not bring voter registration as an idea to Mississippi. That had been black Mississippians for a long time because they could count. They knew that all it took was the, the vote and this whole thing would go down. At any rate, uh, um, two of them, Reverend George Lee and Lamar Smith, voting rights activists, were assassinated you know, within a few weeks of Emmett Till's death. In some ways, uh, if we were in the military, we might, might, we might say Emmett Till's lynching is uh, collateral damage, that he had dropped down into a war, and a war it was. And then Black Chicago. Black Chicago is probably the most important character in the book because what Mamie Till did in this in this act, of, she's often de described you know, courageous, but it's, you can't stress it too much. She's really politically astute. And, she, and before uh, Emmett's body even gets back from Mississippi, she's on the phone dialing reporters. She also leverages the black power of Chicago, which has been you know, accrued over six or seven decades of slow, patient, or community organizing. The Dawson Machine is the most powerful black uh, political organization in the United States, maybe in the world, I don't know. It's a, the mayor before Richard Daley, uh, had, they had dumped him for, for ignoring their uh, needs and also for making some racist remarks. They had, are the ones who installed Richard Daley uh, right ab about the time, uh, the summer of this lynching. So, uh, the Dawson machine, uh, black labor unions like the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters and others, interracial labor unions like the Packing House Workers of America and the, and the uh, steel workers, uh, progressive churches, large progressive churches, uh, a huge NAACP chapter that was le led by labor union militants um, and, was, and was very energetic. All of, the, uh, all of these resources, and I, I point to them because it's not just uh, democracy requires democratic institutions. Political power requires institutions. You know, marching in the street is good. I do it. But uh, uh, you, we, you need to build up strong black institutions if you're going to uh, mobilize and win. And so it's, and what I was really surprised, I had not known that the Till case created a nationwide movement. The thing about all those institutions I mentioned, they're all nationally connected, right? Why can, why can Louis Farrakhan have a million man march? Is it because there are millions and millions of, of members of the Nation of Islam in America? No, he's, but it's because he's got a command structure, he's got an organization. They can put you know, a flyer on every telephone pole in America if they want to, because he, you know, it's an organization. They, these are national organizations. What they do is they build the infrastructure that becomes the national civil rights movement. Before this, the civil right, what we think of as a civil rights movement was uh, you know, a bunch of local movements across the South. Now they, they continue to be the heart of the movement as it emerges and always are, but what this does is it is it leverages all that strength and creates the infrastructure of a national movement. These same labor unions, they raise a ton of money on the protests against uh, the lynching and against the acquittals. 
uh, in this case. They, which uh, the Montgomery bus boycott is the beneficiary of a lot of money from this case. Not only that, but uh, excuse me, the Mississippi Underground you know, fans out across the landscape making dozens and dozens of speeches, every one. And uh, Dr. T. R. M. Howard, a remarkable man from Mount Bayou, Mississippi, uh, goes to a Dexter Street Baptist Church. To, to talk about the lynching of Emmett Till. He's invited by an unknown preacher named Martin Luther King. There's a woman there named Rosa Parks. She's deeply moved. And then four days later, she was uh, ordered to move to the back of a bus in Montgomery and later said, I thought about Emmett Till and I could not move. The uh, So that's the movement that, you know, that uh, passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Uh, definitely, you know, resting upon local organizing, but necessarily a national movement too. And the, and the Till case made that happen. It also turns the, it turns the Southern Civil Rights Movement into a national news story. You know, two, two black boys, 14 years old, were lynched in Mississippi in 1942. We had a photograph of them, uh, their bodies piled uh, in a hole uh, with the ropes still around their necks. It's a striking photograph. The New York Times ran that story on page 25. They declined to use the photograph. That's the national media coverage. So this is there, but they're from Mississippi, not Chicago. They don't have a mama who's politically astute and pulls all of that political power and all of that cultural uh, power. You know, the Johnson Publishing Company, uh, Jet, and uh, uh, Ebony, and about ten other national publications. The Chicago Defender, you know, which is the biggest circulation black newspaper in Mississippi as well as the, most of the country. The um, this story, you know, we think it's familiar. A, a lot of people were surprised the way I was when I was preparing. Uh, Carolyn Bryant's daughter-in-law called me on the phone, and she just, she asked me if, uh, she, she wanted to tell me how much she liked Blood Doesn't Sign My Name, a previous book which is not a conversation I really want to have for a long time. You know, I was, mama said be sweet, and I was nice to her, and I was polite, but then I was getting off the phone. And she heard that in my voice and said, well, you know, I, I actually, I gave your book to my mother-in-law, and she really liked it, and she's coming to town next week, and we were hoping that, that uh, we could get together with you and have a cup of coffee. And I just pretended she hadn't said it. <laughs> and thanked her very warmly, and all of that, but I was getting off the phone, and she could hear it in my voice. And she said, well, you, you, you might know about my mother-in-law. Her name was, used to be Carolyn Bryant. Well, I knew. I'm a historian of the, the, the African-American freedom movement south, uh, 20th century United States. Like anybody of that description, I knew not only who Carolyn Bryant was, but I knew that she hadn't said a mumbling word about the lynching of Emmett Till since 1955 and that much of that time, people didn't even know where she lived, that she basically hid from journalists, hid from scholars, and never said anything about this in public. So I allowed us how I might be able to work it into my schedule. <laughs> um, but honestly, I was working on another book, um, and uh, I thought, well, it's my job, you know, I'm a historian. I got to go interview. If she wants to give somebody an interview, which they had said, uh, I got to go interview her. So I was just going to interview her and then put it in the archive. So some future historian would love me so much. Uh, but we'd have it. You know, that's the main thing. You know, we, historians are concerned that things don't drop. We, we lose most history, you know. We write history out of the shards and pieces of, that are left 
but most of it is gone, right? We're trying to conjure. History is impossible. You can't do it, right? Because you're trying to, con the past is gone, baby, <laughs> right? And we're trying to conjure it back so that we can, ha people can experience that, so people can understand that, so people can know where they came from. If you don't know where you came from, you're lost. If you can't locate yourself in the unfolding human story, how are you going to change the arc of that history? which is the only point to studying history. But it's very important. So we try to do the impossible out of the little scraps that are left uh, and, what, and the sense we can make of them. So I'm not going to let Carolyn Bryant's uh, story. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to interview her. So I, I thought, but also I was pretty sure there had been, already been too much written about it. And I went to the library, and there were tons of things, novels, poems, uh, you know, ballads, uh, memoirs, collections of documents, a bunch of dissertations uh, on uh, the press coverage. A lot of people, the press coverage was so huge that I think people started collecting the press coverage so they'd write a book on the Till case, got exhausted, and then wrote a collection of the press uh, clippings. But uh, at any rate, there's one history book. There was one history of the Till case, a flimsy little thing with not too much research in it that didn't focus on the, on the uh, lynching of Emmett Till and the, or the movement or any of that. Um, so, so that made me curious. And then the, the interview was interesting, but it still didn't get me. But some stuff I picked, this case is kind of addictive. Uh, I just got too much of it on me. People get obsessed. You know, it's a story that sticks to us. It's not just the people who are, there's this, almost a church of Emmett Till out there, people who are obsessed with stuff about Emmett Till, but it also is a story that is stuck to America. It's been 60 some years, and this story is still talking to us loudly. It's been told as a kind of Southern horror movie, you know, starring Redneck Frankenstein, which by the way, much of the traditional narrative of Emmett Till, like the narrative in Eyes on the Prize, fundamentally, uh, after, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam are acquitted. Uh, a guy named William Bradford Huey, who's, who uh, is a journalist, uh, paid them thousands of dollars to, for an interview. With, he was writing a piece for Look Magazine, which is the largest circulation magazine in the country. And, uh, so they, but of course, to get the money, they had to tell about killing Emmett Till. So they couldn't be retried, so they did. They told about killing Emmett Till. And I think what people thought was, if you admit to killing a 14-year-old boy, probably the rest of it's true, too. Why would you bother to lie about any of the rest of it if you're going to admit to I mean, so that became our story. But it's narrated by them. That's really J.W. Milam doing most of that talking. And they controlled the narrative. The, uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a horror movie. He's five foot four, tortured to death by four or five white men. His autopsy, uh, and then some medical research that I did, uh, just, uh, it, it was a hard thing to, it was a hard thing to write. Popped his eye out with some kind of metal device, clipped his ear with some kind of shears, Broke his femur, which is the strongest bone in the human body and actually quite difficult to break. Shattered his skull and then a bullet through the brain, which really didn't matter because there's no way he would have lived even without that. His wrists were broken trying to fend off the first blows. They told, you know, J.W. Milam told a story about a, basically a, a black boy who committed suicide by redneck, who, who was brash, who told them he slept with white women. He was going to keep doing it. He'd sleep with your grandma. He, he was as good as you. All of this stuff that they figured white people, they, the people, the audience that they were speaking to would consider it justified, right? And that story gets told by historians sometimes. The, uh, I always knew that wasn't true. He's a 14-year-old boy. He's kidnapped by two drunk, big, drunk white men with guns in the middle of the night. He's going to mouth off at them. He's going to tell them about interracial sex. I don't think so. 
Furthermore, he's not ignorant of race. He's from Chicago. Chicago is the most segregated place in the world. He loves to play baseball. If, you don't, if you're a 14-year-old black boy living on the south side of Chicago and you don't know where you can play baseball and where you cannot play baseball, you're in a lot of trouble. You know, it's a city of ethnic neighborhoods. Irish uh, kids going through the Italian neighborhood aren't safe, but black boys, most visible, you know, outsider that could possibly wander through one of those neighborhoods. It, it was not, uh, it was not thinkable. There was a, almost a little race war going on just a, 10 minutes from where he lived. Trumbull Park had, that had uh, in Chicago, it's all about real estate, who lives where. And some African Americans had moved into an apartment complex and then the, this place is surrounded by thousands of angry white people. There's a lot of shooting, bombings all the time. And this just kept on going for months and months and months. Uh, that's not far from where Emmett Till lived. There's no way he doesn't know about race. He doesn't know about Mississippi so well. Um, but he, did, he, did he tell off a bunch of uh, white men in the middle of the night? I never did believe that. Um, at any rate, this story takes us back to the abyss where the nation came from in many ways. I think that's one reason it sticks to us, because it's a, it's a, uh, but his story doesn't have to leave us there to die. Because the story's not re really, it's been told just as a crucifixion, really. But what my research found was, was that it's also a resurrection, that the, the, the dreams of reconstruction politics of, of a multiracial democracy in America were revived by this movement. That this, this uh, we had Rosa Parks in Montgomery. We had the Emmett Till generation, as they called themselves. And by this I mean the sit-in movement in 1960, which transforms the civil rights movement into a mass movement, into a movement driven by youth and bold and daring, into, into a, a movement fundamentally grounded in nonviolent direct action. Uh, that piece, you know, those people are 20. They're 21, they're 19. John Lewis, Julian Bond, I could, you know, rattle, you know, and all of them know where they were when they saw that picture in Jet Magazine. You know, it, it, was, a, it was described as a transformative experience. Um, all of them used the phrase, Charlie Cobb and Joyce Ladner and a whole bunch of other people I interviewed uh, used the phrase, the Emmett Till generation. We were the Emmett Till generation. And all of them said that is what pointed them on toward if they ever got a chance to, to attack this system, they wanted to do that. John Lewis said it, that he thought, you know, he was Emmett Till's age. He said, that could have been me at the bottom of that river. That, and that marked him for life. Um, so the question that this, uh, another question that this story ask us is, uh, is this going to be a horrifying moment or is this going to be a transformative movement? We've always got brutal tragedy. This is planet Earth and the human species. We're complicated. One thing we're good at is killing folks. It's a, you know, in America's history of race is steeped in blood, unspeakable violence on and on and on. We've had that. The question is, what do you do with it? You know, when life hands you that, as it does and as it will, what do you do with it? And what they did with it was a remarkable thing. Um, we're in a crisis of democracy now, uh, which is rooted primarily in the politics of race in the uneasiness, in the fear, in the resentment, in the rage of many white Americans about the changes in race relations and the meaning of race in America embodied in our first African-American president, but, but not limited to. 
that. These, are, these forces divided us in the 1960s, and we've been wrestling with that ever since. Uh, those politics are fresh, at least where I'm from. Uh, and furthermore, I wasn't planning to be 60 years old and fighting for Brown versus Board of Education and the Voting Rights Act. <laughs> but, but that's what we're doing, and God knows what else next. So the question is, you know, it's, the, it's been the same question from the beginning. What is to be the role of the sons and daughters of Africa in this republic, in this place? Those who came here as early as anybody else, James Baldwin said, I'm not a ward of America. I was one of the first Americans on these shores. Um, can they ever expect equal justice and, and free access unhindered access to the ballot and a full share of the bounties of American life. And, and then in what way is their fate, the fate of this American experiment in democracy? Emmett, still, Emmett Till's name still resonates in the streets of America. In 2014, I saw couple of thousand young activists, black and white, out in front of the White House chanting, Michael Brown, Emmett Till, how many black kids will you kill? They say his name when they say Tamir Rice, when they say Eric Garner, when they say Walter Scott, when they say Sandra Bland. His name is always there, always there. This story won't let go of us because it's important, it's meaningful. It cuts to the root, the heart of who we are, who we've been, where we're going. They call these things readings sometimes. So I thought I'd read you just about a page and then I'm going to shut up and, because I, I, I'd rather talk with you than at you. Um, it's a lie, but I'm, I, I'm supposed to say that. <laughs> I, I come from like 10 generations of preachers, and I'm a college professor, which is the only bag of wind <laughs> worse than a preacher, right? <laughs> so I am afflicted, <laughs> but I'm going to pretend anyway. To see beyond the ghosts, all of us must develop the moral vision and political will to crush white supremacy, both its political program and its unconscious assumptions. We have to come to grips with our own history, not just slavery and genocide, exploitation and systems of oppression, but also the legacies of those who resisted and fought back, and always fought back, and still fight back. We must find what Dr. King called the strength to love. Our new social movements must confront head on the racial chasm in American life. James Baldwin instructs, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Our strivings will unfold in a fallen world among imperfect people who have inherited a deeply tragic history. There will be no guarantee of success, but we have guiding spirits who still walk among us. We have the courtroom of historical memory where the Reverend Moses Wright still stands and says, there he is. We have the boundless moral landscape where Mamie Bradley still shakes the earth with her candor and her courage. We have the bold voices of the Black Lives Matter movement demanding justice now and reminding us to say his name to remember Emmett Till. We have the enduring NAACP and the Interracial Moral Monday Movement 
coming up out of North Carolina as the sit-ins once did, and dozens of other similar crusades across the country. We can still hear the marching feet of millions in the streets of America, all of them belonging to the children of Emmett Till. So any, uh, if, you, if you'd uh, like to ask a question, uh, we've got two microphones on either side here and they, the, uh, the folks running the place would like you to, to make sure that you use the microphone because they're recording the event and it's being broadcast or something, so. Thank you, thank you. Yes, sir. Have there ever been any studies or books written about the behavior of the jurors in all of these cases where there was an immediate not guilty? Mm -hmm. Well, in this case, there was a local boy, white boy. He went off to Florida State. His, fa his father was a sheriff's deputy right there in Sumner where the trial took place. And so, uh, he decided to write a master's thesis, or an honors thesis, I think, actually. And he went back to his hometown and interviewed a bunch of people, in, in addition to doing all this other research. And he, he interviewed nine of the 12 jurors. Every single one of them was clear to him that they never considered that uh, Roy Bryant and J.W. Milam had not killed him at Till but that he had affronted a white woman, and therefore he had it coming. And that's what nine of the 12 said. So you multiply the behavior of the ones who committed the act by the jurors? Yeah, the jurors are kind of a, a part of that, I think. Yeah, for sure. Um, and of course, it was just the two of them prosecuted. You know, there were, there were three or four more. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm concerned about the uh, ways in which white supremacy passes itself yes. on from generation to generation. And it seems like they mirror the stories of the torture of Emmett Till and reverse the colors. You know, the roving bands of black thugs and rapists and all this kind of stuff. So That's one how, what are the stories, true or false or some combination of that, that they are telling each other, telling their children that we can break down? Who is they in this sentence? White, white supremacists. Right. Well, okay, sure. People who are open and either open and brazen about it, or or subtle and you know think that they're neutral, like I'm, my own brother I got, I got who it, it. wants to use the N word now because the the rappers are doing it. So why can't I say it? Things like that. I'm so tired of talking about that. But yeah, um, I'm Tarzan. When when idiot when white idiots in North Carolina want to say something about black people, they say it to me and they go, you know, basically they're saying. You know, Tarzan, what did the drums say? What do they want? You know. I get so... <laughs> or they're going like, what's the problem with your friends? <laughs> you know, I got a bad place with that. Okay, but, I, but it's a good question. And uh, I think that white supremacy is the water and we are the fish. And most of us can no more uh, contemplate white supremacy in, uh, the white supremacy of our society, then, then fish might discuss the wetness of water. Um, my white supremacy, I, as far as I'm concerned, and I don't mean to judge folks, but I'm just saying, as far as I'm concerned, we are a nation of recovering white supremacists. Yeah. You know, and that <laughs> white supremacy is, a, is, is the notion that God has created us in a hierarchy of moral, you know, cultural, intellectual, worth. 
with light-skinned people at the top and dark-skinned people at the bottom. But, you know, it, and, and uh, white people have that idea in their heads, but black folks got that idea in their heads. You know, there's still the uh, color politics in the black community. There's still, you know, in India, one of the most uh, popular products is, is bleaching cream for your skin. You know, this, uh, you know, this idea of, uh, this, and I think white supremacy is actually more poisonous inside than it is, the, you know, the white supremacy that's directed outwards is bad, but inside it can, you know, it destroys people's sense of themselves, making them feel inferior, not up to, uh, you know. Uh, so I, I think that white supremacy is still killing folks uh, to this day, but it's also, you know, it's implicit in the, our social structure, in our economic structure, in our political structure, and so, uh, it's a big project because it, it's white supremacy is a slogan for some people. It's a political program that's still with us, and it, these unconscious assumptions that 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 water the water and the fish, that's still with us. I find that once I kind of got that in my head, I started to think, and I realized that I stopped using the word racist very much, because racist actually is not a very good descriptive word. Because, you know, if you ask me, is my grandmama a racist? Was, excuse me, but uh, I have to, even if I only get a one-word answer, I have to say yes. But it's a lot more complicated than that. You know, her white supremacy and her generosity and love and her sense of social vision that we must be good to those less fortunate than ourselves, as I think she would put it, um, her white supremacy and, and the rest of her is all wrapped around each other, you know. Uh, it wasn't about some theory of race that she had. It was that, wh that white supremacy that was just uh, the, yeah, it was the water. Um, so, so uh, but once I got it through that, then I, you know, my head became the white supremacy museum, <laughs> which was fascinating. So I'm going, rather than, you know, if you're not like, what white people in America are doing basically is stuffing things down inside themselves and going, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. And that's the, Typical racial conversation in America is, just like in the sandbox, R2, am not, R2, am not. That's about as deep as we get sometimes. But if you stop being in denial and start exploring, it gets interesting. Stuff kind of boils up off the bottom of the pot. And that way I'm going, oh, look at that. The white supremacy, <laughs> yeah. And then I'm in charge, not it, right? And then it just becomes, yeah, it's a, that's a different thing than, ha than being possessed of something that you don't know about, right? Like history, you know, you don't know, you don't know, not knowing history does not make you immune to its consequences, you know, and white supremacy is like that. Anyway, I'll panel along. Yes, sir. Um, I always have to say this. Um, I'm not from the from United States. I'm from the Caribbean. Mm. And obviously... Whereabouts? Uh, a small, two small islands, Aruba and St. Martin. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, obviously, you know, my people have suffered tremendously from racism. And my position that is quite complex because my people of Caribbean descent have played a very cynical role in that process. Mm -hmm. So, you know, complicit with the plundering classes. You know, we are sent away to Europe to the best schools to go study and come back and continue the plundering, et cetera, et cetera. So I want to be very clear that this is a complex issue for me too, yeah. um, although I'm in revolt. Um, the issue is that um, how to do something about this, how to do something about this ongoing. Uh, what I like with your, your book and why I stayed was you started out with the notion of the abyss, right? This starts in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Middle Passage, right? Yes. Um, yes. And obviously, coming from the Caribbean, I cannot stop by but saying, you know, United States is really an afterthought. It is the Western world That's was right. started where I That's come right. from, in the yes. Caribbean, right? The mixing, Absolutely. matching, everything started here. United States is an afterthought. All those become now a main thought at this point, a violent main thought at this point in time. But the issue is now how to do something about this, right? Mm. I'm a little bit worried when you say, um, that you know, you know the notion of implicit bias, right? Yes. Uh, 
even if whites, uh, just one of my old universities, I've been in many different universities, but one of my old universities, University of Utrecht in the Netherlands, a professor there, I think she's from Caribbean, Caribbean, she just wrote a book, what she called White Innocence. That whites, basically what you're saying, right? That whites have this notion that they're innocent, so if you attack them about racism, uh, you know, that's just not, we just yeah, innocent. Turning into a personal question about their, their, their heart. Right, exactly, right? And the notion is how to do something about this, because the issue becomes, even if you are aware of it, if you're gonna do something against white privilege, white imperialism, Right? At that point in time, we need to talk about massive redistribution of wealth income. We need to talk about reparations, right? We need to talk about ongoing, ongoing, multi-layered, hundreds of years, de-racist education, right? We need to talk about completely rethinking the white academia in the United States and in Europe, right? Which is largely just a justification for white imperialism and white racism, right? Uh, so there are many, many issues that would need to be dealt with here, and I'm wondering, um, you know, where to start, how to start. Obviously, um, black revolt, obviously, the notion of a kind of a black organized um, pan African resistance, which is breaking down because as everybody becomes independent, we distance ourselves from each other. Yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm from the Caribbean. Oh, no, please, God, don't, don't identify me with African American people. You know, no, 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 no. You know, all of this type of complexity starts to, starts to come into this process. So, how do you see? And watch levels, in which way? Obviously, the UN has done some things, some good things, you know? Yes. But how do you go about starting this massive re-education, re-conscientization, re simply remaking of ourselves process that has to be done? And I think we are at a point, right? Uh, one of my backgrounds is so-called French-Dutch. Look at what is happening potentially in France. That's deep. Uh, That's deep. Marine Le Pen walking into the presidency, right? If you want all hell to break loose, and you think hell break loose in America with Trump, Marine Le Pen, president of France, then we have hell. That's a big old question. <laughs> but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to try to give it a succinct answer, which is, only a, which is only sort of a stab at a piece of it. For one thing, I don't know how to give advice about race politics in the Caribbean. Because, you know, it's... Part of, part of this has to be indigenous. You know, people have to organize the, the place they know, the place they have influence, the place they have uh, organizations where they, you know, institutions, and mobilize the institutions that they have available to themselves. You know, and that's very indigenous. And of course, the histories, as you noted, are quite different. White supremacy is, a, you know, if y'all got the title, we're, we're still doing fine. <laughs> we're in the white supremacy department. But um, anyway, uh, I think we're going to do two things. One is uh, white people have got to learn to take part without taking over. Right? And we, the movement must be explicitly and centrally anti-racist, anti-white supremacist. And that has to, uh, so we need strong black leadership. And we need black unity. There's nothing wrong with uh, or that black unity as an organizing principle. That's not anti-white, you know. That's just positive black. It's not, you know, and that should be, that needs to be at the heart of the movement. What we're doing in North Carolina, uh, I work for Reverend William Barber, and um, <laughs> who is the real deal and a brilliant man, and a good, a good man, um, and a great political leader. But uh, what we've got is a, you know, a multiracial, multi-faith, uh, kind of morally grounded movement that's indigenous to the state and mostly directed at the state's politics. That's what they've done. Is, but anyway, I'm going go by that. Um, we've got strong black leadership, but... Uh, I mean, I used to be real easy to find at the meetings, if you get my drift. <laughs> but then when Reverend Barber started uh, building a coalition in earnest, when he went to LGBT, the politically organized LGBT community, when Amendment 1, when they were trying to pass a constitutional amendment against gay marriage, he came out and fought it. If they hadn't let white people vote in North Carolina, Amendment 1 would have gone down like a brick uh, we've 
they, black precincts in all seven metropolitan areas voted three to one or two to one, between two to one and three to one in all the black precincts of all the metropolitan areas. In the rural places, it was about 50-50. That, we, we got defeated because the mountains, it doesn't have that many people in it, but if you get 82% of the vote, it ends up being a lot of votes anyway. Also, the white suburbs, uh, where it was perceived as a, as a partisan issue, and there's a lot of Republican voting for it. But um, also, uh, you know, the environmental movement and, and, the, and uh, people deeply involved in women's issues, um, you know, and, and on and on. Uh, we, don't, we don't ever have a gathering that doesn't have an imam and a, and a rabbi, you know, <laughs> And we're, uh, we're developing a movement culture that is inclusive. We're learning how to talk. It wasn't, you know, it hadn't been, it hadn't been easy every minute. Anyway, uh, but we've got strong black leadership and we've got black unity and, uh, it, and we've got a whole lot of white people who don't want to screw it up this time, right? And who are trying to learn about water, you know with varying rates of success. But, uh, but it's a strong and growing movement, and uh, we, just, we just defeated. There was only one Republican governor, in, in, in incumbent, that couldn't get on tr Trump's coattails, and that was ours. We, um, so. Anyway, so, it's, so it's right. coalition politics is the only way, because just look at the numbers. We're not going to have a, a majority. It's a, it, many pluralities. It, we need to stitch those pieces together, right? From, right? Other because we're up against a river of money. We can never match that, right? All we can do is people power. Um, so, and that is going to require coalition politics. We we don't have much experience in, but we've just got to get some. Got you know, it, it it's people are getting the idea. Yes, sir. Sorry. Uh, Mike, would you indulge me in uh, answering a, a question about um, Jim Crow laws? Are sure. You, okay. Um, there's we have a household. We have a bit of a household argument uh, that my the way that oh, I, I ain't getting into uh, a household argument. Yeah, the way, <laughs> you're, you're the on your that, own. <laughs> no, please, please. Uh, right the, behind you. Way it, behind. It, it, it was just uh, we wanted to know how pervasive Jim Crow laws were. Uh, outside of the South, well, were there? First of all, I'm, I'm presuming that there were Jim Crow laws. Were there Jim Crow laws outside of the South? Oh yes, yes, yes. But what happened is, when we haven't really finished writing this history, you know. So the District of Columbia. This is one thing. When uh, yeah. I love that movie Lincoln, I really did. You know, it's a good movie. It's well made, and you know, I like the reality of the politics and all that. But there was a major mistake that they could have fixed so easily if they had a DC historian on the staff. The, um, you know, the, the there's a black man who's Lincoln's valet, and he's kind of an important presence. He doesn't do a lot in the movie. That guy was the leader of the movement in the District of Columbia. You know that there's a wo black woman who attends to, uh, to uh, Mary Todd Lincoln. Uh, she is, at, was actually uh, very important in that movement, and uh, Mrs. Lincoln gave the movement a lot of money. So, and all those people that came, all those black folk who came to, to sit in the galleries when they passed the, uh, the 13th Amendment, um, you know, that was the movement. So we, we could have had, you know, black self-assertion. We could have had reality, in other words. Uh, we could have had, had the organizing that pushed that uh, change. You know, uh, during World War II, there's an enormous civil rights movement. People always say civil rights movement. I want to go, which one? There's an enormous civil rights movement in the District of Columbia that desegregated the restaurants and stuff. And in Cleveland, at Boston, uh, early on, uh, you know, talking about, uh, you know, 18... 60s, 1870s, 1880s, is they're battling about, uh, you know, what public space and who can go where. Uh, so there's, there are movements everywhere. Nothing changes without 
organizing a movement strong enough to push it down. I mean, you know, that's just how things change. And it happened everywhere. It's just it happened at different times and in different ways. Hi. Um, I have just one little comment and then a suggestion. One is I'm, I'm sorry about your saying that it kind of dismissing the lie of the woman you know, uh, I th think you s it sounded like you were dismissing. It doesn't really matter whether she lied or not, uh, because then I just meant that it didn't change. The I know, but situation. it's so important I say because it doesn't matter. I okay, I, I, yeah. all right. But I was Moral I'm reading a book matters. called True Flag, about uh, Stephen Kinzer's book about uh, you know the beginning of our imperialist adventure in 1898. And the lie that you know was used in that was the remember the Maine, the U.S. warship, and then I know we all know we're lied to repeatedly. Gulf of Tonkin, you know, a, a warship is fired on, and whatever. It's all lies. So it, we're constantly, and no one is held accountable, uh, and and still going on because uh, I'm Kathy Boylan, and I believe that 9/11 was an inside job to lead to war. But anyway, I am a Catholic worker. And uh, the, the person who started our movement, Dorothy Day, um, uh, said, our problems stem from our acceptance of this filthy, rotten system. But beyond our, the way we accept it is we pay our taxes to it. And they, so this flood of money that is, is uh, coming against us, we have an answer. And the answer is, don't pay the federal government any money. And I ask people to think, Say we lived in, a, in an apartment building. We were paying rent, and the landlord was taking our money and going off and uh, you know, killing people with it. We would put our money in an escrow account and pay for the services we were being denied. Is there a question? This is all. It's, it's, it is a way. It, it's a question is, can, can all of us get out of this arc of violence and exploitation, whatever, by refusing to pay the money to the empire until such a time that the empire starts acting justly. Right now, we're all in complicity with everything that's going on if we're paying our taxes. So my, uh, my appeal to you is to consider it. Look up the National War Tax Resistance, Resistance Coordinating Committee. Look at Dorothy Day. Look at all the people who refused to pay the money. If we, if we pay the money, take the money that you would pay to the, pub, uh, to the government, take it down to the public school that's going to be threatened in another month because of the new education secretary, or to the clinic, or to the whatever that's going to lose funding under Mr. Trump. If you can find a question in there, but... Uh, I, think I, I think I got it. I think but, I got it. But we're not just questions. We yeah. are solutions. Of course, All right. Of course. Thank you. So... I love Dorothy Day. Thanks. I fell in love with Dorothy Day. Me too. She wasn't alive anymore, so it was kind of a limit to our, our relationship. Didn't didn't really take off the way it might have. Get to know me. But okay, okay, okay. So, uh, and her phrase, "a revolution of the heart." Yeah. I usually don't even say anything in public without using that phrase. It's it's so important uh, because it's not we we have to change. We have to. There's no substitute for political victories. Absolutely not. But we, all, we have to change not only our, the leadership, but we have to change our culture, and we have to change our hearts, ourselves. So that's a piece of it. So I, and I love, I love that uh, phrase, but that's not your, an answer to your question, which is, in my mind, the question is, how do we organize the movement? Right? Nothing's going to change without the movement. Right? The movement uh, is what matters. And... and we have to organize the movement. It doesn't seem like a very good organizing strategy to me. I don't think we're going to be able to mobilize around that strategy. So that's just my opinion. If, we, if we're in an organization and we're you're, you're advocating that as our central issue, I kind of think it's not that I don't like the idea. I just don't think that's going to organize us. You know, where we could. That, that, that's all. That's all. It's just an, I'm, I'm looking at it as an organizer. I don't know how I get. Uh, I see your point, and I, I think it's sort of morally sound, but it's not enough to be good, you know. Oh, it's such a thing as being too good to do good. Yeah, yeah. I don't really. It's just I don't think it's a movement building kind of issue. So that's, and I think we have to have the movement. But that's just my opinion. 
uh, that rooted in my experience, which is different. I love your organization. Uh, I won't tell any stories about it. I have a hard time. Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. I just have a simple recommendation. Um, uh, recently, I went to see, went to the African American Civil War um, Memorial and Museum. Mm -hmm. And they have a video there Where about is that. It's near U Street, 14th and U Street. Thank you. It's U Street, U Street and Vermont Avenue. Okay. What street? U Street. U Street and Vermont Avenue. And Vermont Ave. It's okay. in the Cordoza area, but U Street and Vermont Avenue Thank is the you. exact address. And it's right off the subway, literally, right off the subway, the memorial is. And uh, the, the African American Civil War Memorial is right off the subway, right at that stop, the U Street Cordoza stop, and the museum is across the street. Yeah. Okay. And my recommendation is that they have a video about the killing of Emmett Till that not only gets into the graphic details of his death and you see his, his see the damage, see his head, but it also gets, makes me more, made me more aware of the climate, the racial climate that existed at that time and probably to a degree still exists today. So I just wanted to make that recommendation. Thank you. Okay, uh, yeah. thank you. I have no argument with that. This is and I want to see that museum. By the way, if, if you're interested in that topic, you loose. might uh, want to read Fire of Freedom, Abraham Galloway, and the Slave Civil War. It will blow your mind. It will tell you how much we don't know about the, the political life of the enslaved and also about the Civil War. It's a, I won't tell you the story, but uh, Abraham Galloway and the Slave Civil War. Yes. Hi. Thank you, Mr. Tyson, and I look forward to reading your book. I do have a couple of questions about it. Um, as I know we're running out of time, but as quickly as you can kind of go through them. But I'm really intrigued by your comments at the beginning. You said that you weren't surprised that Ms. Bryant lied, but what did surprise you about your interview with her? Uh, also, do you think that the FBI may take another look at this case in light of these new revelations? Um, and also, if you can talk about why, I, know, I understand the interview was done about 10 years ago, so why this is just now coming to light, why? Yeah, 2008, so yeah, about nine, yeah. Okay, nine, nine, um, but kind of right. why you held on to it or, or why it's just now coming to light. Uh, and then the last question is, do you know if there have been any efforts between Ms. Bryant and the Till family to reconcile in light of what she has now said? Okay, that's a lot of different questions. Okay? <laughs> so like, uh, one is the FBI uh, investigated her in 2005 and found nothing prosecutable, no angle of to prosecute her. And then, it, but it went before a majority black grand jury, and they voted not to prosecute her. They didn't. They thought there was not a case to be made. What she has done with me is confessed to perjury. So I asked my lawyer about that, and uh, he said that uh, the statute of limitations on perjury is two years. So she'd have been free and clear after 1958 on, on that score. I, so I don't think that I don't think that is going to go anywhere. But this, you know, I'm not a lawyer, and it's not my role. The uh, let's see. This was a hard book to write. One, it's such a hard, dark story. And um, I remember when I set out on this, I thought this is going to be a quick book. You know, it's a hard, it was a hard book to write. Uh, a lot of times I just didn't want to go down in the hole, you know. Um, and that was, that was very, very difficult. Also, the evidence on this, in this book goes across the planet, you know, because it's a global thing. Uh, it involves the anti-colonial movement across the world. It involves, you know, the State Department records. There's a, it creates a crisis in American foreign policy. It's a, that's another piece of the story I haven't really hinted at. But, uh, and there are a lot, there's a lot more. It just took me a long, long time. 
And uh, so, you know, I wasn't expecting to spend nine years on a book, but uh, that's what it took me to do it. As far as like putting out a press release, you know, it, after I interviewed her or something like that, honestly, it just never even occurred to me. In fact, I, to me, it wasn't really the morning news that she, you know, I didn't really, you know, I didn't think about it, to be honest. It just, I'm a historian. The pressure on me, I mean, what I felt like pushed to do was to get the thing right, to tell the truth insofar as it's possible, to dig and dig and dig until I, I felt like I, I knew as close to the truth, not about the whole story. Um, so, and in some ways, I'm not really drawn to the drama of the white conscience, you know? That's kind of an American narrative, too. To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, uh, Long Walk Home with Whoopi Goldberg and Sissy Spacek, what will the white woman do? Will she do the right thing? Will she admit that she's wrong, 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 and then change? You know, it's like this drama of the white conscience. I'm not saying it doesn't matter. I'm just saying it, I kind of find it yucky. I just, I'm not, I'm like, because it kind of changes the subject to white people and their virtue or lack thereof. When really, I'm interested. I'm interested in the movement, uh, which includes white people. But, and, and I'm, it's not. But it, at the time, uh, I felt like, my my my, you know, that's deep. She's got, she's all twisted up. Uh, she and she and God have got a lot to talk about, you know. Uh, he, surprise! You ask what surprised me. Um, how ordinary she was. She seemed like every Methodist church lady that I ever knew, you know, growing up in the preacher's house. I remember, think, I've always thought about, you know, the women who took my face in their hands and told me they loved me, you know, when I was growing up. And taught me how to sing uh, Jesus Loves the Little Children, red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. I bet everybody who taught me that song was a segregationist, you know. <laughs> we, got, we got some crazy business going on here. Um, doggone it. Where'd I go with what, what was that question? Anybody remember the question? What surprised you? What surprised me? So, yeah, it surprised me how ordinary she was. Um, I guess I had some kind of monster in my mind or something, or it was just so horrible. I didn't know what I expected, but it's like pound cake and coffee and uh, a very familiar person. Of course, I've all, you know, my whole life I've been wondering how. Otherwise, good people could have a blind spot so bad. Uh, but this kind of takes the cake, so to speak. I mean, that's, um, uh, it surprised me, and I think it was useful uh, to find out about the culture of the Milams and the Bryants and what kind of families they were and what their folkways were and what was it in them that allowed them to do this? I don't know as I answered that exactly, but I felt like I got a ways into that. And that, that was, a, it, you know, it's not, yeah, that's about what surprised me. Yes, sir. Professor Tyson, thank you for your time. We're out of time at this point. Oh, okay. Well, thank y'all for coming. Appreciate it. <laughs>